take a hard left turn into seriousness, shall we? Okay, now, during a speech on racial equity this week, President Biden ordered the federal agency that oversees housing to correct the, quote, historical racism in federal housing policies. But you may be asking yourself, where did those policies come from in the first place? How did we get here? We'd like to break that down for you now in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? Lately, there's been a lot of talk about systemic racism. Everyone claims they want to fix it, but we can't even agree on what it is. We just know it's bad, like poverty or pollution or the way white people dance. But systemic racism isn't just an idea, it's a real thing. There's a place where you can go and see real live systemic racism right in front of you. It's called The Hood. I'm sure you've heard about it. Your favorite rapper grew up there. You've probably seen movies about it. In a movie, you can tell you're in the hood because there's always rap music playing in the background when the brave white savior goes there to drag Jamal away from the gang so he can play in the big chess tournament. But have you ever wondered how the hood got that way? Systemic racism, that's how. In the 1930s, America was in the thick of the Great Depression. The banks had failed and everyone had lost their homes and unemployment was at the highest it would ever be until this idiot came along. So FDR had an idea called the New Deal. The New Deal gave jobs to nearly every American, set the minimum wage, and created a retirement plan called Social Security, and it worked. For the first time in American history, you could have a regular job and make a decent living. You wouldn't necessarily be rich, but you wouldn't be poor either. They called it the middle class. To get that kind of job security today, you would need three jobs and an OnlyFans account. Now, if you're wondering if this New Deal made things better for black people, the answer is, See, part of the New Deal was the Homeowners Loan Corporation. They were an organization that guaranteed home loans for everyone. But just like an episode of Friends, they didn't include black people. How could they separate the white applicants from the black applicants? They didn't have to. Segregation did that for them. Because of segregation laws, black people could only live in certain areas. So the United States government drew up color-coded maps for nearly every city in America and told the banks, we'll guarantee loans for everyone who lives anywhere except in the red areas. Those just so happened to be the areas where black people lived. Like how the only thing behind glass at Walgreens just so happens to be Miss Jessie's. They created a system based on racism to make sure black people couldn't be a part of this middle class. They came up with a name for it too. They called it redlining. We called it the hood. But that's way in the past, right? Like Downton Abbey phones and these pants. What does that have to do with now? Well, how many of you watching right now live in or know someone who lives in a home that their parents or grandparents owned? That's called generational wealth. and. Home ownership is the number one driver of wealth in America. Number two, of course, is how many Beanie Babies you have. You can use a home to pay for college or start a business or, you know, not be homeless. But if you look at almost any major American city, most of the formerly redlined areas are still majority black and low income. That's because banks didn't stop doing this until, hold on, let me look it up. Let's see, when did banks stop? They never stopped. Homes in majority black neighborhoods are valued at 25% lower than homes in white areas, even when the crime rate and the neighborhood amenities are exactly the same. And because school funding is based on home values, the average non-white school district receives $2,226 less per student than a white school district, which is why the gym in a public school in a black neighborhood looks like this, and the gym at a white school looks like this. There's even studies that show schools in black neighborhoods have smaller libraries. Meanwhile, at the white school, they're checking out Encyclopedia Brown from here. And because wealth and education are the number one factors for crime, police are more likely to patrol these neighborhoods, which is why even though there is no difference in the rate of drug use between white and black people, let me say that again, there is no difference in the rate of drug use between white and black people, Black people are three and a half times more likely to be arrested for drugs. It's like a reverse Hunger Games, where the odds are never in your favor. Most drug arrests occur in redlined areas, and studies show courts hand out 20% longer sentences to black people who commit the same crimes as white people. Wait, maybe that's why white people dance like that. It's the dance of a person with no consequences. 
So maybe all of this is why the average white family has 10 times the wealth of a black family. Not because black people like Jordans and shiny rims, but because there is a system designed specifically to make it true. Home ownership in America is more rigged than a basketball hoop at Coney Island. And maybe that's why black people are always rapping and bragging about where we come from. We're not celebrating the hood. We're letting you know that we survived a system that took our free labor and our tax dollars and gave it to everyone but us. We're telling the world in no uncertain terms that y'all can't kill us and we won't die. So if you want to know what systemic racism looks like, just go to the hood and tell Jamal good luck at the chess tournament. This has been How Did We Get Here?